Mike Vinegar. He's portfolio manager at MV Wealth Partners, part of IAA Private Wealth. Thanks so much for being with us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So the TSX is finding support here, as it typically has over the past year. It's been in this stuck in this trading range. But, you know, we're worried about a correction. The NASDAQ is sort of, you know, 1% uh, away from an official correction and 10% pullback. How are you thinking about this? Uh, well, we were expecting a correction to happen. Uh, look what happened. Against all odds, everybody was so doom and gloom last year. And January, the calendar turned, and wow, markets just jumped out of the gate. And I believe uh, in July, August, we had a high on the S&P, which was up 17 on the year. We're now up 10, 11 on the year. So we've given back about 40% of the gains. Yeah. NASDAQ was up even higher, so it's given back more. But, you know, markets are still up. Um, the economy is still strong. Unemployment rates are still low. Um, and so there's always something to worry about in markets. There is, and it's always scary when you mention something is at the same level that it was in 2007. Right, because that evokes memories of the financial crisis. So put that into context. Should we be afraid of rates at these levels? For growthy securities that maybe aren't profitable, that were valued based on very long-term cash flows, those may feel some pain. And I'm talking about, you know, some of the tech stocks down south, maybe even some of the Canadian ones where, you know, you're really need to look out 20, 30 years to, you know, grow into the valuation. Higher interest rates contract those net present values. Um, but when you look at 2006, six seven, the last time, as you mentioned, that the rates were this high, you've had a lot of other industries doing quite well. Why? Because they have pricing power, because they're the value stocks, because they can grow their profits even at these higher rates. Another thing that we are perhaps nervous about is oil prices, the effect that it could have on the economy, on the inflation picture, and rates. Should we be afraid of that? Um, listen, of course, oil transcends into many different industries. Asphalt, chemicals, plastics, gasoline, jet fuel, yes. But unlike the 70s, unlike the 80s, unlike the 90s, nobody's talking about the fuel efficiency that our economy has gone through. Mm. So yes, as the barrel of oil goes up, it hurts, but at the margin, it doesn't hurt as much as it did when the barrel of oil went up in prior periods. So let's put an investing lens on that energy sector. Uh, obviously, oil prices at these levels, great if you are an energy producer, if this yes. is the stuff that you sell. But why would you buy an energy stock here with, with oil at, at $90? I mean, aren't we reaching the upper limit of where oil is going to go, even if it moves to $100? Um, isn't the risk more tilted to the downside? It's possible that it is tilted to the downside. Let me answer that question in two parts. Sure. One, there's a seasonality aspect. So if you look back at the last 30 years, do you want to buy equity, energy equities right now? Maybe not, because technically speaking, we're sort of entering the what's called the shoulder season when you've got lesser demand because the refiners are switching over from uh, motor gasoline for driving season into winter heating fuel, etc. But in terms of the valuations, the market and market participants have hated energy stocks for the last five, six years. I mean, they've basically gone nowhere fast. And I think now the market is maybe realizing that there has been a huge underinvestment in energy, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And if demand doesn't suddenly crash, we may be into a supply issue. So the valuations today don't need oil prices of more than $75-ish to continue the upward trend. And here we are at, what, 93, 94. I, I hear this valuation argument uh, quite a bit. And of course, on a relative basis, you know, the TSX oil producers as a group are trading under eight times earnings. That's, you know, cheaper, cheaper than the market. But what should it be? Should it be more expensive than the market? Should it be at those levels? Because you are at the whim of a commodity <clears throat> that you can't control. Well, so when you're talking about producers, okay, you're talking about a finite resource, 
right? So every producer is different. I think you have to distinguish the ones that have, let's say, 40, 50 years of reserves in the ground mm -hmm. versus ones that maybe have four or five years. You can't, you can't put them all in one box and say, this is how they should be valued. Um, having said that, we look at free cash flow, we look at reserves, we look at the balance sheet, and we look at the value in the ground, and we look at the forward strip price. And from that, you can have a probabilistic way of deducing what the NAV, the net asset value, yeah. should be. And right now, you look at things like Suncor, or Canadian Natural, or Whitecap, or Synovus. These are very cheap entities if you believe that, yes, there will be a transition, but it won't happen for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Years. And for now, these balance sheets are getting so strong and the companies are able to buy back so much equity that we think there's a huge upward trajectory here. So you're nipping away at energy. I noted that while the TSX has not officially corrected under the hood, that's basically taken place. 80% of TSX composite composite members are down 80, 10% uh, or more from their 52-week high. Are you buying amidst that wreckage? And, and what's on your shopping list right now? Uh, so we're finding, we've got a target list of companies. Uh, we're not pouncing just yet okay. because from a seasonal and technical perspective, uh, if, if you ask me to give you my perfect crystal ball, uh, we think that while markets may bump up a little bit here, we're assuming that in the first couple of weeks of October, maybe third week of October, we will have one more, oh my God, moment. Okay. We think that may be the opportunity. And specifically, we're looking at energy, agriculture, industrials, some financials, preferably the private equity life co plays as opposed to necessarily banks. Although if banks do get cheap enough, we'll look there too. They're not cheap enough yet? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Um, again, the dividend yields we think are safe, but from a valuation perspective, uh, we're not sure that the market has fully valued in the credit cycle that we think is about to happen and how many quarters we still have of these credit loss reserves building. You're looking for signs of seller's exhaustion, right? And, and you think that it comes in October. I mean, how do you gauge that? I mean, do you look at the VIX? Do you look at volume? Okay, so the VIX is, in our opinion, not as good of a tool as it once was. Okay. Why? Because there's this new phenomenon today called ODTE, which stands for One Day to Expiration Options. And it's been all the rage. And we're wondering to ourselves whether the VIX, which is a measure of the 30-day volatility versus what everybody is going into now, or not everybody, but a lot of players, it is the VIX... A, because it's such a well-known indicator, yeah. but B, because it's 30-day versus this more one-day thing, uh, is it as good of a gauge? Um, we look at sentiment. We look at seasonality. Mm -hmm. We look at cross-current flows. Money has to go somewhere. So where's the money going? Is it going to bonds? Is it going to commodities? US is dollar. It, is it going to the <laughs> US dollar? So we, we look at our charts. We look at our indicators. But at the end of the day, Amber, we're value investors. And we're looking at balance sheets. We're looking at cash flows. We're looking at moats and good management. And we're finally starting to see some bargains appear. And we think that we're going to get our opportunities to pick our spots. All right. You'll